Hey, this is Jared Cochran with Family Church. Welcome to our podcast. I'm excited that you're here. I hope that God moves through this message to reach you so he can move through your life. Be sure to share and subscribe so that we can reach the world with God's word. Enjoy the message. Welcome to everybody. We're glad to have you with us. And those of you that are watching online, my name is not Jared. My name is Philip. I am the lead pastor here. We're glad to have you with us this week. Let us know where you're watching from and how we can pray for you. We've got people that are literally routinely all over the world, all over the country that are watching. I don't know if I mentioned this, but last week, and y'all, people that hate TikTok, put your fingers in your ear. Last week, 670 people were watching us live on TikTok last week, just from St. Augustine, Florida, to wherever they were. So we're glad to have y'all with us, wherever, wherever that is. So curse the platforms if you want, but God's going to use them for His glory. Amen? This week coming up, just quickly, one, two, three, I've got to get some things out because I want to go to work. If you're a teenager, ages 13 to 18, did you hear what I said? 13 to 18, there is a Nerf war that is going to happen on Tuesday night here in the building. They're probably going to tear stuff up, but it's going to be all right. Any teenager anywhere is invited and welcome to be here. And no real firearms, just Nerf guns. I've got to make sure I announce that in this church. Somehow bring your own. I made one. Uh-uh. No, no, no. Don't bring your own Nerf gun. It's going to be fun. It'll be a fun time for them, six to eight. Those of you that have been waiting for this, it is about to happen. And we look forward to offering this as another option for what people need in their lives. Our grief support group is getting ready to start in the middle of August. Uh, it is going to be an ongoing online meeting with uh, one of our members here who is going to head that up and lead that up. Uh, Kelly is going to be in the information center immediately following the service this morning if you'd like to stop by and meet her. If you're going through any kind of grief, if you're experiencing grief or if you've had trauma in your life and you haven't been able to process that properly, that is where we're going to go. That's what we're going to do. It's going to be a great thing for us to offer. So make sure that you pray that that is going to go over well. And if you have a need for that or you know somebody that does, make sure we introduce them properly to that. Uh, I know that I, I have not in my lifetime processed a lot of grief properly. And if you don't process your grief properly, it comes out in many different ways that you don't want it to. So if you're just looking for a way to connect, and that might be something that will help for you as well. Two last things. If you're a musician or a singer and you've been trying to connect with us and get involved musically, you have to see that man right there after service. He'll be in that little glass cage. You have to walk over there and <laughs> say hello to him. That's the way to do that. And lastly, I'm bringing you one more update on the land. I asked everybody this week to pray that, that, that simple prayer with me that we know that all things work together for good to those who love God. We we're supposed to be closing on Wednesday, the 24th, which is Wednesday this week. Right at the very tail end of it, the bank said we need one more thing. We need to have this, this thing done. So we were like, okay, so that's going to mean that we have to extend it. So we are getting a 60 to a 90 day extension. And they, uh, well, no, that's good. <laughs> because that means we don't have to start making payments for 90 days. So all y'all that buy here, pay here, y'all know exactly what I'm talking about. You're like, easy squeezy, catch me later. Pray for us that we get this done. It's, I can't even tell you, I can't even tell you the marathon that has, has been to do all this and get all this done. I would have stopped a long while back if I didn't believe that it was God. While we were in this process, and I'm not going to tell any secrets because, you know, I'm, I'm not supposed to, but right as we were wrapping all this up and coming to the very end of it, I was, I was starting to have some thoughts about it. And one of the attorneys that was in the room that represents us, that is also a representative of the largest developer, not just St. John's County, but one of the largest developers in the nation. Good friend of mine. He leaned across the table and he said, Philip, buy it. I can't tell you why, but buy it. Okay. I, I, okay. I trust you. you. Not many lawyers I trust. That one I trust. <laughs> I just found out this week. Do y'all know where the Silverleaf development is on two, or 210? The Silverleaf development, which is a massive complex out there. Yeah. <laughs> They've bought the land that goes from 207 all the way to 206. And when they come out of the front drive of that massive development complex that's going to be built, guess whose church they're going to be looking at? Our, our building is going to be right over here. So 
I'm excited about that. I don't know if anybody else, I told you all last week, there's a Publix coming out. There's a new Publix coming out in that area over there and another developer is putting in 1,400 homes. St. John's County, don't curse the growth. It's growing. It's going to happen. That just means there's more and more people moving here that we need to reach. Amen? Amen. Let's be a part of it. If you have your Bible, open with me to 1 Kings chapter 17. Did you bring your Bible with you? 1 yes. Kings chapter 17. I know you've been standing for a little bit. Would you mind standing for the honor of reading God's Word together? A familiar story. 1 Kings chapter 17, starting in verse 1. And Elijah, the Tishbite of the inhabitants of Gilead, said to Ahab, As the Lord God of Israel lives, before whom I stand, there shall not be dew nor rain these years except at my word. Then the word of the Lord came to him, saying, Get away from here and turn eastward, and hide by the brook Cherith, which flows into the Jordan. And it will be that you shall drink from the brook, the brook, and I have commanded the ravens to feed you there. So he went and did according to the word of the Lord, for he went and stayed by the brook Cherith, which flows into the Jordan. The ravens brought him bread and meat in the morning, and bread and meat in the evening, and he drank from the brook. Verse 7. Which is also incidentally is the number of perfection. It happened after a while that the brook dried up. Because there had been no rain in the land. Then the word of the Lord came to him saying. Arise, go to Zarephath which belongs to Sidon. And dwell there, which was a journey of about a hundred miles. See, I have commanded a widow there to provide for you. And verse 10, with seemingly no hesitation whatsoever, so he arose and went. Father, give us a word today in due season that everything that we do honor you today. And we thank you for it. And they said together, Amen. Amen. You may be seated, having done this for as long as I have. One of the things that I've learned is that there are times when a sermon delivers on a particular level. And then there are other times when there is a word from God that is given intentionally that is so focused on the moment that you are in that you, you yourself have a hard time wrapping your senses around it because you cannot believe that the God of heaven would create something so perfect for the scenario that you happen to be in at the moment, not trying to oversell this, but this is a word for us as a church in this season. The notation there in verse 7, the brook dried up, is an enunciation of a change of conditions. I know that you've lived long enough to know this, that in your life, conditions will always be changing. Amen. Oh, come on now. I said you've lived long enough to know this, that your life is always going to be changing. Amen. If you like the same you're going to have to die because that's the only way that you can stay that way. God was saying to Elijah in this moment, your change is here. Your next is now. What was is not what will be moving forward. That does not mean that where you were is bad, but what that means instead that where I need you to be is more important than where you have enjoyed being for as long as you've enjoyed being there. One of the most important steps in correctly discerning the season of your life is to correctly discern the season that you are in in that moment. Amen. I want to build on something this morning. I want to build on something that you said last week when you preached on the dream is different. What a great sermon. The dream is different. The word for today is that phrase, the brook dried up. And the secondary thought that I want to give you this morning attached to that one is this. Listen to me carefully and see if there is any kind of a witness in anybody's spirit in this place. Something's got to change. Something's got to change. We always talk about change, but people in the world hate change, even though it happens constantly. So, Father, today, as I pray once more, let this word be lamp to feet, light to path, and we give you praise for revelation. And they said together, Amen. Amen. Not long ago, I started doing a, a Bible plan on U version. 
that was written by one of my absolute all-time favorite authors. It was written by David Platt. Some of you will recognize his name, David Platt. He's also the young man who wrote the book Radical. He wrote the book Radical in 2010. And what captivated me about that book, it's a book that literally changed my life as a Christian. Um, the subtitle of that book was Taking Back Your Faith from the American Dream. It sounded offensive, but it was powerful. Taking Back Your Faith from the American Dream. The imagery on the front of the book was a house upside down. And so the imagery that he was portraying to us is that something's messed up. Something is out of order. The house was upside down. If you've never known him, if you've never read the book, I'd like to introduce you to him. And I would like to recommend that you invest in yourself and read that book and hear the story of how it all came about because the backstory of it all is just as important as the story itself. In 2006, at the age, the young age of 27, uh, David Platt had the distinction of being the youngest pastor of a megachurch in America. At the age of 27, he was pastoring a church that had over 2,000 people in it, which is the accepted definition of a megachurch. At a time when, when most people are still trying to figure out just like what to do with their life or what to do in ministry, David Platt was already the pastor of a thriving church with several thousand people and what appeared to be what was going to be an amazing, an amazing bright future. That This guy was going to, if he's already at that level at 27, what in the world's going to happen when he gets up into his 40s? I mean, this is going to be an amazing journey to watch. But right in the middle of all of that, he had a profound change of heart. It was not a crisis of faith. Don't mistake it for that. It was not a crisis of faith. It was a profound change in his heart that was based on the realization that he had. Listen, that the Christian faith that he was experiencing was not supposed to be what it had become. That the Christian faith, as he was experiencing it, was not supposed to be what it what it was and what it had become in his life. At 27 years old, pastoring thousands of people, he, he stood up one day and he realized, this is not working. In the book, he said, it's easy for American Christians to forget how Jesus actually said to live. Mm. In the typical American church way of thinking, the typical American church has become way too heavily influenced by the Americanized way of thinking. Hello, America. And so he wrote the book Radical, which was a full-on challenge to the church, to every Christian, to go back to step one, change, start over again, and live their life a different way. That's what the book Radical is all about. If you've never read it, you've got to get a copy and you've got to read it. We have got to have believers go back to step one, start over again, change, and live our lives on mission. Reminding us that the purpose of God's blessing on our life. American church. Is not so that we can be successful. Or rich. Or famous. Or build bigger barns. So that we can brag about all that. Look what we've got. But the, the real purpose of it all is to serve and bless others. To serve and bless others. And then, on a personal level, abandon everything that we have to take up the cross, follow Jesus, preach the gospel, reach the lost, become disciples, and then make disciples. And if you're wondering what I just said, I'm explaining what Christianity is supposed to actually look like. It's not supposed to look like the, the thing that we have made it out to be. We're supposed to take up the cross, follow Jesus, preach the gospel, reach the lost, become disciples, and make disciples. Amen. That's it. The Bible plan that he wrote was called Something's Got to Change. I was browsing my Bible plans one day and when I saw that, I said, come on. If there was ever a Holy Spirit moment for where I'm at in my life right now, there it is. 
It was based on his experiences while traveling through the, the region of the Himalayan mountains where there were 9 million people. Listen to this. In this region where he went, there were 9 million people, but only 100 confessing Christians. I, I can't even wrap my mind around that. 9 million people. And only 100 of them confessed any faith in Jesus Christ. And the challenges that he gave them in that, that Bible plan reminded me of our church. Thank God. Because he said, if we're really going to make the impact that Jesus made, we are going to have to meet people at the intersection of their physical and their spiritual needs so that we will have an open door to be able to share Jesus with them. Amen. And I thought, if that was ever family church, there it is right there. Thank you, Jesus. If we're ever going to have the impact that Jesus had, we are going to have to intentionally meet people at the point not only of their physical needs, but their physical and their spiritual needs. Because if you only meet them at their physical needs, you have become philanthropic at best. And if you only meet them at their spiritual needs, you have become theologically based. But if you meet them at the intersection of their physical and their spiritual needs, that is when you are actively living the gospel. It is Matthew chapter 25. Which is the basic bottom line of this house. Feed the hungry. Clothe the naked. How much does it cost? We don't care. <laughs> Visit the sick and those in prison. How many times? Just do it. Feed the hungry. Clothe the naked. Visit the sick. Visit those that are in prison. Which isn't, surprise, surprise, commonly how the church of 2024 operates. Y'all don't realize how different you are. That's not how the church in our, in, our, in our era operates. No need to beat that dead horse, but I, I'm in a horse whipping mood this morning. <laughs> so I'm going to whip that horse for a minute. The much more common Americanized version of church, somebody please help me if you know I'm telling you the truth, is this. Sunday, sing, sermon, see you next Sunday. That's it right there. I just boiled it all down. I let the cat out of the bag. The cat is running all around this building. Oh, we have a great church. What do y'all do? Oh, we, we go to church. What do you do? We sing. We hear a sermon. And then we see you next Sunday. Pass out business cards. Make connections. Look cool. Sound cool. Go viral. That's what we hope for. Every stupid church in America is hoping to go viral. Outreach. Somebody just say that word so you know what it is. Outreach. Outreach to the hurting and the lost is mostly ignored. We just sing, have a sermon, and it'll see you next Sunday. And the bulk of our time in too much of the New Testament church seems to be focused on recruiting people from other churches to leave their church and come join ours. I said it. I ain't afraid to say. That's the bulk of our time. We spend too much time inviting people from other churches to leave their church and come to our church because they'll like us better. And the bottom line that he gave to us is simple. Something's got to change. I'm going to say it until it becomes mantra to you guys. Something's got to change. Something's got to change. And, and I think there's a remnant. Please, there's a remnant of believers that knows that. I believe there's a remnant of people who can feel that down somewhere inside that, that we know this mechanism is in place and it's going, but something literally has to change if we're going to make the impact that we're supposed to make. I said it several weeks ago that they are predicting that by 2050, the Christian church is going to lose 66 million members. Our days are over. We're going to get smaller and smaller and the world's going to get worse and worse and it's going to keep going like that. We, the church is irrelevant. Old people are dying. Young people are not going to church. And we can either keep doing the same things that we've been doing and hope for a different result or we can all confess this out loud. Something's got to change. Repent. Seek God and do our first works again. That's what's been boiling around in my head now for the last several weeks. Amen. And I thank God that I'm in a church that understands that. At the same time I was doing that, that Bible plan, I was reading 1 Kings 17. Mm. 
I've loved that story since I was a kid in Sunday school. Anybody else? Amen. Walk into Sunday school, teacher said, today we're going to talk about Elijah. I'm like, let's go. I know that story. Uh, the heroism of it all. There's a hero and there's a villain. There is Elijah and Ahab and Jezebel. <laughs> I just like saying Jezebel. Jezebel. Mount Carmel. There is 850 false prophets all lined up against that one man of God. There is, by that man of God, there is an impossible challenge. Build an altar. Cover it with water. Cover it again. Cover it again. Cover it again. There is a simple prayer. 63 words. Woo, and fire. The fire of God falls from heaven. Burns the sacrifice. Burns the wood. Burns the stones. And licks up all of the water that's in the trough around the sacrifice. Sin is defeated and a national revival is set into motion. The whole nation turned back to God. Amen. In 1 Kings 17, the nation is drowning in sin. Look for parallels here. The nation is drowning in sin when Elijah appears before Ahab and Jezebel and says, as the Lord says, at my word, there will be no water. There will be... I can't even, there'll be no dew, there'll be no rain, no water until I say so, except at my word. After delivering that word, God sends him to the Kareth Valley, tells him to remain there. And this is the part of the story that, that everybody knows from Sunday school that every morning he got DoorDash. <laughs> Isn't that great? He's just waiting for his orders and a raven flies up, <laughs> drops Bread and flesh in the morning, bread and flesh in the evening. And during that time, he drinks from the brook, the brook, this Cherith Valley, the brook that is there. We don't know how long Elijah is there, but he's there for quite some time until verse 7 says that eventually, listen to that notation, the book dried up. This week, well, actually three weeks ago, when I read that, I locked in on that. Not only as a, as a physical experience for him, but in, a, but in a, larger, a larger sense of what that represents. In the physical sense, the brook represented what he needed in that moment to survive. It represented, if you will, the provision and the providence of God. There's a drought. There's been no rain. There's no more water. But every morning... And every evening, he has food, bread and flesh in the morning. And then whenever he's thirsty, he just walks out and he drinks as much as he wants. Sometimes we all need reminders in the hard times that God Almighty is God Almighty. Sometimes we need reminders that God is our source, not your job. God is the one who meets and supplies every need that you have, not the government. God will, he says, supply every need that you have. And so what I looked at in this moment, and just come with me if you will, Elijah is in that comfortable, familiar, convenient, sustaining place that you can become so used to that you don't even recognize it. Ravens are bringing him food. The brook provides water. And then one day it's all gone. And watch this from your Bible. The moment that it happened in verse 8, then God spoke. Verse 8, then the word of the Lord came to him saying, arise and go to Zarephath. I've, sustained, I've commanded a woman to sustain you there. And in verse 10, so he arose and he went. God give all of us a so he went spirit. Yeah. See, there's, there's not much time that you're going to say, so he stayed, so he went, he went. God was saying, this is over. At the time, this is where you needed to be, but now there's somewhere else you need to be. And what I see is that metaphorically, listen to me, we're going to build this, is that the brook dried up is the signal that this is over and now it's time for next. I don't know, I'm sure you have, but... 
I don't know if anybody in here has ever had a brook dry up on you. But if you have, you know this, this is what it is. It happens when God's provision and God's providence stops coming to you from a particular direction. He was supplying and providing your needs in one way, but then he stopped. Now it's clearly time to change. One of those moments is in Joshua chapter 5. In Joshua chapter 5, after they have crossed over from Egypt into the promised land, if you know the story, that God provided their needs for 40 years. He gave them manna. He gave them birds that flew in. He gave them the food that they needed and the manna that they needed. And immediately when they went into the promised land, after 40 years of supernatural supply, verse 12 of Joshua 5 says, Then the manna ceased. That manna... They would have it no more. It would never happen like that again. It would ne- they got up every morning for 40 years and just walked outside and picked up what they needed for the day. But now, after 40 years, that is over. I want you all, if you all will, I can see by the look in your eyes, you're, you're, you're needing this. Pray for revelation right now. That when that happens, God is giving you a signal. It's time. There is something new for you. If you have been there Please right now testify that losing your brook can be frustrating. Anybody in here that's ever lost a brook in your life, you can testify that it is frustrating when that happens. You got comfortable. (laughs) Things were just beginning to work out for you like you had always hoped that they would be. You were getting very, very comfortable at doing what it was that you were doing. As a matter of fact, in some places, you were planning on building a house right next to that brook so that you could stay there forever. And what you did not notice is that you had been there so long that you forgot what it was like before it was like that. I'm going to preach before I get out of here today. Somebody's going to hear a word from heaven this morning. You stayed there at that brook so long that you forgot what it was like before it was like that. The struggle in your life is over. You're sitting down by that brook. Oh, man. Every day is easy. Here comes the bird. Let's go. Let's eat. Here comes the bread and flesh. Here comes the water. I'll just walk over and get a drink out of it. Every day is easy. Faith is forgotten. And prayer gets put on pause because you don't need it. I don't need faith. I don't need to pray. You are in that sweet spot where the Americanized version of Christianity has told you you need to be. Ah, blessed. Oh, you're blessed. You're, y'all are getting confused. Stay with me. It's going to... It's going to come out all right when I wash it out. (laughs) Blessed and full and satisfied and happy, comfortable. Saying every day, oh, ain't God good? All around me, people are having all kind of hell going on in their life, but I'm right here by this brook, and man, all my needs are taken. Everything's working out good for me. Hallelujah. Ain't God good? And then one day, he takes it away. Oh! And we can either curse the devil for fighting us or we can bless God for freeing us. Because sometimes when you think the devil is fighting you, the devil is not fighting you. What he is doing is setting you free to do what God wants to do now. I'm saying this out loud, whether anyone likes it or not, that too many in the church this world have forgotten the lesson of Job. That Job had it all, lost it all, and said in Job chapter 1, the Lord gives and the Lord takes away. I don't care. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And from that moment, then his life really went into the toilet. He went through more trouble than he had before. But by Job chapter 42, he ended up the story with twice as much as he had before. You can either curse the devil for fighting you, or you can bless God for freeing you to walk into what he has for you next. Somebody's going to get this before. Jonah, chapter 4. Jonah has been through all that he has been through. Swallowed by the fish, blown up on the shore, preached to the city. He goes out of the city and sits under the shade of a gourd. Y'all know the story that God gave him. Oh, thank God for this gourd. 
Lord, my bald head, just sitting under this shade, just so good. That night, a freak of a worm comes and eats the, the, the cord and kills it and it dies. And the next day, all Jonah can focus on is that. That doggone gourd is gone. And here I am sitting in the sun. Instead of the reality that over 120,000 souls in Nineveh was saved. So you're a little uncomfortable. Ain't that a shame? Come on, American church. It's not popular theology, but it is absolutely true that yes, God does provide brooks in our lives, but sometimes he also sometimes lets them dry up. Why? Because we like them a little bit too much. And when we get comfortable, I'm only going to say it, when we get comfortable, we get caught. We stop growing. We stop praying. We stop trusting God. We stop reaching to do something. We stop having an impact on the world and the world begins to impact us. If you've ever had a brook dry up, you probably know this, that by drying that brook up, God is trying to press you to step out on faith and search out his provision in another place, in another way. I've been there so many times and I can speak to this. I'm, I'm there right now. So I can speak to this like everyone needs to hear. A brook can be relationships that you get into and get comfortable with that you have no business being in. Even though you're in that relationship, you don't even notice it, that they're not sharpening you and you're not sharpening them. And if you're not sharpening them or they're not sharpening you, all you're doing is getting dull. Oh, but I really like hanging out with them. It doesn't matter. If your relationship with them is not drawing them closer to Christ or their relationship with you is not sharpening something on the inside of you, you're just in a relationship that is dulling your sword every day that you stay in it and that brook will dry up, but you may stay there. A brook can be your income. Can I say the word? Money! That'll be on YouTube. People don't like saying money in church. I worked my whole life to get where I am. To get the money that I've made. And now I finally have enough. I've got money. 62 years old. I, no more struggle. Hallelujah. I can pay my bills. When I walk into a restaurant, I don't look to the right side of the menu. I just look at the left side of the menu. Y'all don't know what that means? Huh? You know, when you're young, you go in a restaurant and you're like, uh, have a glass of water and a sugar packet. Right? Because you're like, man, I'm broke. I shouldn't even be in a restaurant in the first place, but I'm hungry. So you're looking at the right side of the menu. Oh, that burger's only $10. I, I just want a burger today. Can I get a half of one? I finally have enough money. You get to that place where your money is, can become the brook of your life. It can become the brook that you sit by because I can pay my bills. And the next thing you know, you're not being generous. You're building bigger barns. And sometimes, I don't know if it's ever happened, but sometimes that job goes away. Not because the devil stole it, but because God saw it. That you were trying to serve God and mammon. And it's much better for you to serve God and be broke than to be rich and go to hell. And this, before y'all get your pants all up in a wad, there's nothing wrong with being wealthy. God wants you to be blessed and prosper. Amen. Amen. We need people to write big checks. But, but don't let that become the story of your life. A, bill, a, brook, a brook can become refreshing places in your life. After you've been through a long struggle, anybody know what I'm talking about? Yeah. When you've been through a long struggle, many months or many years of hell, and then you finally get to a little sweet spot, and you're like, "Woo!" Somebody, who was that? Somebody, "Woo!" I finally, hallelujah! I've been through all this hell, and now I, I hit me a little sweet spot. Jesus loves me. Everything's going good. Problem is, I got there and I stayed longer than I should have. Because I like that. Anybody else? 
I'm going to be flat honest with y'all. I like not struggling. Right. If you like to struggle, you're stupid. I like chill, man. I like to get up and have life go clickety-click, clickety-click, things working out. Hallelujah. My enemies are all dead. Y'all hear what I said? I said it out loud, too. Sometimes the only way you get victory is that you outlive your enemies. I've outlived most of my enemies. So I like not struggling. I like not having anxiety. I don't like anxiety. You know, when you're young and you have so much anxiety because you're just, oh my God, oh my God. Everything's an oh my God. I don't like anxiety. I don't like fear. I don't like the fear of things that life brings at you. And so when I do get to a place where it's working out, I stay in that safe space, never noticing that while I'm staying there, it has stolen my faith away. And then, amen. And then when I need faith to get out of it, I ain't got none left because I haven't been walking by faith for the last several years. That's my story right now. I'm working on it. An assignment in your life, on your life, can be a brook. I'll let that ruminate for you for just a second. An assignment on your life can be a brook. Mine was children's ministry. Forty years ago, and it still breaks my heart. From 1982 to 1985, I was a children's pastor. And I used to make a joke. I said, I'm going to be the oldest children's pastor the country has ever seen. I one time said, I'll be 60 years old and still doing this. Amen. And then in 1984, God pressed me an entire year. An entire year, God pressed me about a change. And I finally said yes. And the only reason I said yes was because I recognized that what had brought me so much joy in my past was no longer bringing me joy in that day. I used to love to get up and go to church and teach six to 12 year olds. And man, we would have a ball and we would throw things around. It'd be great. But then finally... God started dealing with me about it. And a year into that, I was like, I can't stand this. I can't stand being here. I don't want to do this anymore. I sure missed that. In a strange way, I'm trying to preach, y'all. Bitterness can become a brook in your life. Bitterness can be the brook that you can't beside. And you stay there for as long as you can. The Bible talks about fresh water and bitter water. And sometimes we get stuck right there. We get stuck, even, that's a, even though that's a bitter brook, we get stuck right there rehearsing the names and the stories of every person that's ever hurt you in your entire life. You can, re you can rehearse it just that fast. You're sitting by a brook that needs to dry up. Your personal abilities can be a brook. All my can-do people out here. Oh, I can get that done. I can get that done. I don't know. I don't need your help. I don't need your help. No, y'all. Y'all sit down. I got this. I, I got this. That I got this is the anthem of hell. Your personal abilities can become a brook that you sit down and you stay there too long. Brothers and sisters, what if Elijah had never left the brook? What if on the day that it dried up, he'd have walked out there and saw the sand and kicked the sand, the sand and complained to God about how much he liked that brook and how much he deserved to have that brook running there. Why have you done this to me? What would have happened to the widow and her son? The, the widow and her son who experienced miracle after miracle because of Elijah. Who would have won the victory against Ahab and the false prophets if he had stayed there for the rest of his life, complaining that the, the brook dried up and maybe it's going to rain again sometime. Maybe God will let it rain. Who would have turned the nation back to God? Who would have handed the mantle to Elisha if he had stayed there? It doesn't do any good to complain to God when the brook dries up. It doesn't do a bit of good. It's okay to be sad. But the sooner you get up, 
And the sooner you start moving, the sooner he can show you what your next assignment is. And brothers and sisters, there's always a next assignment. There's always something more for you to do. He could have stayed there and dried up with it. And I don't know if anybody in this building or watching is going to understand this, but I truly believe this, that for so many in the church world today, that's what happened. They found a brook, they stayed there, and they dried up with it. But here's a blessing to encourage you. <laughs> in your life, if one season is ending... There's already a next one lined up. Isn't that good? If one sees this ending, God said, God said, I have commanded a widow to provide for you. So he got up and went. You may not know this, but in this season, God is already at work in your next season. He's got it already prepared and laid out for you before you ever get there. Pay attention when God takes something away from you. Not one amen. Y'all like, uh-uh, I ain't saying that. That's a trick. That's a trick right there. No. Pay attention when God takes something away from you. Pay attention. Because it may be that very thing that's keeping you in the place that you no longer need to be. Amen. To pay attention. When God well, God doesn't take things away from us. Yes, He does. Yeah, come on. It's even in our songs. He gives and takes away. He gives and takes away. See, in the American church, we think so much like Americans. We think all He does is give us stuff. No, He gives and He takes away. Amen. But blessed be His name. Amen. In Deuteronomy 32, you know the story. Singers, y'all come on. I'm, I'm almost done. The, the, the eagle's nest, I think you've preached this, that the eagle creates a nest with all kinds of comfortable feathers and stuff that's on the inside of it where the eggs are put in there so they're safe. And then when the eaglets hatch, as the eaglets begin to grow, this process is true still to this day that the eagles start pulling the soft stuff out. And so each day that goes by, the eagle, the mom or dad, takes out like a, a feather or something or a piece of cloth or Something that was very comfortable. And so the little eaglets are sitting in there with no, and things are starting to poke on them and, and hurt on them. And the reason that he's doing that, or she's doing that, is so that eventually that nest will become so uncomfortable that those little eagles will go, I'm an eagle. I can fly. And he'll do that. And off they go. Right? And so the longer you get just sitting by that brook waiting for that to happen, the more time you're putting in between until you can do that. And when you do that, you're going to experience something else in your life. Let's pray. Terrible sermon, but I hope you get the point. And in and, and, and all honesty, on, on some levels, I was probably only preaching to myself this morning. Thanks for playing along. I hit that comfortable season. I told you all that a few months ago. One of the reasons I was struggling with this next move and purchasing land and going and doing all that again is because I got to that place where, man, this is nice. This is comfortable. I love this. Bills are paid. The building is full. Oh, that's, this is great. Let's buy land. Shut up. <laughs> Y'all don't know how hard that is. You don't know what the hell's, what, what kind of hell's coming at you. Clip that for me. Because that's what I meant. That's what I meant. What kind of hell is coming at you? That's what, that's what I meant. That's what I meant. It wasn't like a two-inch preacher cuss moment. That was, that's what I meant. Because it is. I mean, you, you step out there and hell says, okay, let's go. We need it. <laughs> Father, today, let this word breathe life into someone. If not here and now, then somewhere in the future, they'll 
find this and hear this and it will speak into their life for the season that they are in. But for us here and now in this moment, in this day, let this word, let this word be fresh water. Let us respond accordingly by faith. morning and maybe you are right now in a season of change and you don't like it or maybe you're struggling with it. This word is for you. This word is for you and if you're in that struggle of something that God is doing right now, I want to give an invitation for prayer and I'd love to see you find a place at the altar to humble yourself and just seek the face of God. God, honestly, I don't know what you're doing right now. I don't know what's going to happen next, but I don't need to. I know you. So I'll keep holding your hand. You keep walking me through this. Maybe you're sitting here this morning. And all you've heard is that that brook is dried up. And maybe you're in a dry season right now. I don't need to put much of a finer point on it than that. Maybe you're in a dry season right now. You need the rain of the Holy Spirit to fall in your heart. You need that refreshing. You need that refreshing of the Holy Spirit today as much as you've ever needed it. A place to pray. To seek the face of God. Pour out your spirit in my life again, Lord. Maybe I'm in a dry season and I don't like it. Come Holy Spirit. I need you. Maybe you are sitting by a brook that is or has been drying up. And maybe God has his finger on something in your life and he's calling you further, calling you to something more. Even if, no matter what your age, age doesn't matter. He's calling you to something more. But God my whole life to get here. And I like it here. It's comfortable. It's convenient. It's predictable. I like it here. Well, you can stay there if you'd like. That brook will dry up. Convenient seasons. Maybe you're in that financial place where God is now challenging you to go to the next level and be generous with your life. Obey that. This morning, this word speaks loudly and clearly into my life. But where I'm standing this morning is, is flat-footed right in that same space. I like comfortable. I like predictable. I like the season that I'm in. I liked where God has brought me in. It took 40 years to get there. I just really like to enjoy that. The brook dried up. Where you were is not where you will be. So Father, have your way. Take this water, turn it into wine. Let someone today hear the very word, the very word that they needed so desperately in this season. And I thank you that this is your work, so do it your way. In Jesus' name, stand up all across the building on your feet this morning. In a moment, they're going to sing, and I'm going to give that last invitation for you to come. If you're sitting in here this morning, and this, you can recognize this is a word from God for your life, and you just want to pray, we would love to meet you there and pray. If you're in that season where things are changing and you just want to abandon it to God. If you're in a prodigal season and you've been away from God, you just want to abandon your soul back to God. Let's do that together. But this morning, I promise you this, that God's word will not return to him void. And it has gone out into this room this morning and beyond 
into someone's life that desperately needed it. And it's time for someone to go back to the basics and abandon yourself to God to the very beginning part. Humble yourself before Him. Repent of whatever you need to repent of. Seek His face. Turn to Him like you did when you first believed. And let's trust God that this next season of your life is going to be the most faithful season. Where are you at? I'm just going to believe God that this next season of my life is going to be the best season of my life. So old folks, you too. I'm with you. Find that place to pray and say, God, this next season is going to be the best season. I'm not going to play it safe. I'm not going to play it easy. I'm going to trust you and I'm going to believe that what you're doing right now is the next thing. Hey, I hope that message spoke to you today. I want to say thank you to everybody who is involved at Family Church and those who help support this ministry. If you would like to get more involved, you can click the link in the description or head to our website, familychurch.social. We would love to connect with you, and you can find all of our social media platforms on our website. Also, if this message spoke to you in any way today and you liked it, consider sharing it on your social media in any way that you would like so that we can help reach those far from God and return them to the arms of the Father. We want to see God work through you. We love you. Thanks again for listening. God bless you.